hello and welcome everyone to my youtube channel so uh, yeah as you can see today we're gonna be reacting to the uh, napoleonic war series uh i just want you to know guys that i have no idea about uh, the napoleonic wars or the uh, uh the wars how they were fought uh, the tactics etc so i have no idea and uh, yeah i have some little information about napoleon as he were not uh descended from a uh, aristocracy or uh, a king so he came to power to merit as i believe and uh, yeah that's all i know and he dominated europe uh, with invasions etc so yeah let's dive right into the video uh, make sure you check out uh, epic history tv for their original content this plus <laughs> In December 1804, mm -hmm. in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Mm -hmm. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than ten years. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne war would dominate his 10-year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead. So, I have a question right away after hearing this. Was Napoleon an aggressor? Or was it self-defense against the other regimes? Because I know when revolution spreads, the other countries fear uh, that the, rev the revolution could spread to their countries. Were they like afraid from him? Let's check out. Head and a continent in turmoil. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation. You know, I love I love this style of, of documentaries. Like the, you you don't see the the, the uh, historians talk. You can see their faces like you get out of the atmosphere. This gives you like the real atmosphere. You feel like you're, you're right into Europe. You feel the air. Uh, this is this is extraordinary. I appreciate this from this uh, channel. Nation. How they present it. The French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain. And Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along the Channel coast. But as long... So he's try he tries to invade Britain itself. As long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. Mm -hmm. But nor could Britain challenge France on land. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon using diplomacy and gold. So it's kind of like uh, the Cold War between France and, uh, and Britain. Uh, the main war is between these two countries. The others were involved through the British influence and propaganda. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy, and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated, and Europe's balance of power restored, if there was ever to be lasting peace. Mm -hmm. Pitt found willing allies in Europe, among monarchs. I already feel that Napoleon is a badass person. <laughs> ...who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution, and a dangerous okay. threat to the existing order. Austria harboured the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Mm -hmm. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition. Like, France is in circle, like, how could Napoleon win this? 
This seems impossible. And devised an ambitious plan for a series of this guy must be genius against France. If he could do it. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans and reacted with typical speed and decision. He was determined to strike first before the Allies okay. could join forces mm -hmm. and ordered his army, now renamed La Grande Armée, to La march Grande to the Armée. River Rhine. Mm -hmm. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally, and was now dangerously isolated from the other allied armies. So unlike recent wars, I think in this era, in the World War I, they still believed that uh, the advantage is always with the aggressor, who strikes first. To disorientate them and uh, yeah, we know for quick victories. That's the strategy that had been used throughout history and until World War One. It was proven completely wrong uh, when they faced the new technology and scale of uh, mass destruction of weapons. So yeah, this uh, this this works in this era. This tactic of being the aggressor. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, mm -hmm. while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. <sighs> before radios, before... Uh, I appreciate this more. Like, how, could, how would you coordinate an ambush like this one? It's must be extremely diffi diff difficult because you you, you have uh, information transmits uh, transmitted by by couriers and uh, it takes time to reach the others this must take huge uh, like uh, administration and uh, paperwork to do this more than tactical and courage that summer Napoleon's Grand Armée was at its most formidable. So they are going to they are going to talk about details. I love this channel so much. Like uh, <laughs> it's very educative. Well trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, mm -hmm. it had been newly reorganized according to the corps system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery, and supporting arms, such as reconnaissance, engineers, and transport. This is very smart. Like, was he the first one to do it? This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently. The yeah, they said uh, he said like it was later imitated by virtually every army in the world. So he was the first one to do this. And the problem is with this formation is the coordination. Uh, if your communication is cut, you're doomed. You won't know what's happening with the I think they would call core for one, two, three, four. So the mini armies, you won't know. If they are in trouble, if they need help, if they are retreating, uh, this is this is the weak point of this formation. But it's genius. Like if you could make it work, it's gonna be genius. Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated and advance with his corps widely dispersed. Mm. This helped to disguise his real objective. So he is the first advantage. The enemy wants to know which direction you are heading. What is your objective? Yeah, this is smart. And increased movement speed, because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land. Okay, this is extremely smart. Because imagine you have a huge army. You have to supply them. You have to make a stops to feed the army and wait for 
wagons or train or whatever had been used to feed your army. Now each army has a would make a small pause to feed and resupply, then they could keep moving. And uh, yeah, this helps uh, to increase movement speed, as he said. Taking its supplies from scattered villages, rather than relying on slow-moving supply wagons. Yeah. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. You know, because I, I, I've played some strategy games, I, uh, this is why I love this stuff. Because uh, I feel like I'm playing a game right now. Like, Age of, I have played Age of Empires, uh, Company of Heroes. I love I loved kind of this kind of wars or games. And this era is uh, very interesting. This is how Napoleon's how army was able to move at a this. speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. Mac launched a series of poorly coordinated counterattacks, but despite some see here, Mac was trying to be smart. Was trying to do the same tactic, like to be aggress, to be the aggressor, to strike first, ahead of his uh, allies, and yeah, Napoleon had acted uh, with uh, his own tactics and his own uh, uh, formation of the army to outmaneuver him. So this the tactic of being the aggressor must be carefully studied because uh, it could lead to complete disaster. I I don't think Mark is gonna. He, he is doomed. Desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him, but the Russians were still 160 miles away. And so at Ulm on the 19th of October. Just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. The French took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners. This is a huge Napoleon number for this year. First like how, how they were dealing with prisoners, I have no idea how they were dealing with prisoners. I would love to know. If you could help me like in the comments below, tell me how they were... Do they feed them? Do they have the prisoner camps to hold them? Where these prisoners go? Devastating blow against the coalition. Russian general Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary. Because sixty thousand men, I think Napoleon's army is about one hundred thousand men, as he mentioned before. Like sixty thousand prisoners, it's like a, the same. It's equi almost equivalent to your army. It's like having a huge army, another huge army, and deported to a prison. How would you control them? How would you... This is a mystery to me. I'm gonna have to do some research about this. Commander, more cautious than Mac. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia. But hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. Napoleon pursued. Oh. The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not. Like General uh, Kutuzov. Kutuzov was. Is he a coward? Like. Or is he a very smart person? I think he's smart. Not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements, as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now his army was also exhausted and far from home with winter approaching. He needed to force a decisive battle quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian emperor sought the glory of battle.
overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected, near the town of Austerlitz. Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours sleep. He's a hard working man, I think. Yeah. Look, he looks. I think he works harder than, uh, than his generals. Side a campfire. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor, and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. Holy hell. <laughs> this is like this is like literally playing a video game right now. <laughs> this is amazing. The morning of the 2nd of December 1805 was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a 7 mile wide battlefield. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to steamroller the French right, before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. Like, is he gonna keep watching you swing in? To his right, and he wouldn't act. This this idea this is uh, kind of stupid to me. Like it takes a long way to out for uh, okay. but you would strike first w with your army divided. This is obvious. You shouldn't do that. I think. Little did this is my know, opinion. I may be wrong. Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move. Whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights to cut the Allied army in half. Yeah. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements. Yeah. The speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counterattack. The battle began around 7 a.m. as Austrian troops of General Keinmeier's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay, and it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz's village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force marched right in time in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Around 9 a.m., his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz, before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights, and he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied center. Catastrophic. General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organize a defense of the heights, using troops of four column. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on... I love the paintings. I love them. ...ammunition and turned to the bayonet. 
By 11am, the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights, and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured oh. the village of Bosenitz, before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Land's V Corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last allied so this is the ultimate like uh, sending the imperial guard Reserve. this is the elite of uh, each army i think in a desperate bid to reclaim the pratson heights a battalion of the french fourth line regiment was charged down by russian guard cavalry losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting napoleon who'd moved up to the heights sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Napoleon had broken the Allied centre. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Around 2 p.m., Napoleon ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. French artillery opened fire trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. The French Emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. This is genius. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield. Many left un... Like, the losses are incomparable. Absolutely devastating. The Battle of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. So now he had beaten the Austrians and the Russians. As Russian forces I think the war is over. Back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France, agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson at the cop. So this is Lord Nelson. <laughs> this is actually the uh, the battle we have uh, they have mentioned in the uh, previous video about the victory. Cost of his own life had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance not just for the rest of the war, victory but for the yeah. next 100 years. Oh. 100 so is it literally world war one until world war one like british dominated now the seas after this victory this is so like a huge and very important battle i think i have to watch it britain master of the sea yeah Napoleon, <laughs> unbeatable on land the whale and the elephant yep neither exactly able to challenge <laughs> the other in its own domain the whale on the elephant. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that map of Europe. It's it will not enough, be wanted yeah. these 10 years. A month later, Pitt was dead. 
but his warning that Europe faced another ten years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. One man who transformed a continent. If you want to find out more... Yeah, thank you guys, definitely. <laughs> After these uh, victories, uh, this guy must be genius. Yeah, and patient and hardworking man to achieve this. And uh, yeah, during, he's not fighting like uh, normal nations or... He's fighting like the superpowers of the age, like Britain and Austria and uh, Russia. Uh, this is huge. Like this guy is a genius. So thank you guys for watching. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next video about the Napoleonic Wars. I hope you have enjoyed watching with me. And uh, yeah. Thank you, and I leave the link to the original content if you want to watch uh, Epic History TV. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and see you later.